Well, one consequence of the war in Ukraine is that Europe is now scrambling to reduce its dependence on Russian energy. I say this with great regret and without any joy that Germany is dependent on Russian energy. We have to save Ukraine right now. And, and the bottom line is, yes, we have been warning about the energy security risks, but also the national security risks. American people have to be ready for even higher energy prices. I think, you know, there is an understanding of that this is in essence a small price to pay, particularly if you look at what's going on in Ukraine and you put yourself in their shoes. The key is to remember here that uh, uh, Ukraine, one way or the other, we're going to resolve it ultimately, over X number of years. But climate crisis remains existential, just as it was before the Ukraine crisis came up. And the money that should go to healthcare, that should go to education, that should go to fight climate change, this money will now go to tanks, to missiles, to fighting wars. If you're like me, you have probably been very disturbed by the conflicts that are raging globally at the moment. Whether it be Yemen, Ethiopia, Myanmar, or the subject of today's video and the mainstream news cycle at the moment, the acts of war Russia has taken against Ukraine. Now, I am in no way a peace or geopolitics expert, so I don't pretend to understand all the dynamics surrounding this conflict and its long history. But I am a sustainability expert, and I do think there is an interesting dimension to the conflict related to the energy system and the fight against climate change. For those of you who missed it, this week the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC for short, released the second component of its sixth assessment report, which was focused on the impacts of climate change on the planet, vulnerabilities in the system, and potential adaptation strategies. Now, I'd originally planned to cover this report this week, but so many other creators have done a fantastic job summarizing its findings, which I'll link some of them below. So I thought a more useful and interesting analysis would be to unpack and explore the linkages between our energy system, climate change, and conflict, and specifically how the situation in Ukraine shines a blinding spotlight on these issues and forces our world leaders and all of us as individuals to examine what kind of energy system we need, not only for the planet, but also for peace. Before I get into the video, I did just wanna say that I'll be donating my YouTube earnings for the month of February to various charities that are helping people in Ukraine. Now, I still have a small channel, so it is modest, but I'll put the links to those who I donated to in the blog post in case anyone wants to join me in supporting. So I think the most logical place to start is by painting a picture of the situation we are dealing with in terms of the energy system and specifically Europe's reliance on Russian natural gas. Russia is a huge oil and gas producer and player globally. It is the second largest producer of natural gas and the third largest producer of oil. The country accounts for 17% of all global natural gas output and 12% of all global oil output. And if we look at exports, the picture becomes even more stark. Russia is the world's largest net energy exporter of combined oil and gas. In fact, oil and gas make up 60% of all Russia's exports. Russia has direct energy relationships with more than two dozen European nations, as well as China, Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, and other countries as well. And those trading relationships are incredibly important for the Russian economy. Oil and gas accounts for approximately 15% of its GDP and provides 39% of its federal budget revenue. So given all this information, it is not a stretch to say that oil and gas have directly funded Russia's military and provided the country with an important economic position that frankly emboldened Putin to take the steps he did against Ukraine. Put quite simply, oil and gas have become political and economic weapons. 40% of all natural gas and 25% of all oil used on the European continent comes from Russia. This clearly played into Putin's political calculations as he likely believes the country's exports are too important to sanction. And frankly, he's probably or at least partially right. Europe does have enough natural gas in storage to get it through the spring, but what happens when winter comes? The thing we have to remember about the energy system is that it cannot turn on a dime. It is large scale, complex infrastructure, which takes a lot of time and a lot of money to build. 
This means that if Putin were to constrain or cut off energy supplies from Europe in the lead up to winter, the only short term options available for meeting Europe's energy needs will involve fossil fuels. According to Scott Montgomery's most recent piece in the conversation, there are three viable options for meeting this demand. The first is restoring the Iran nuclear deal, which would allow Iranian oil back into the market. The second is increasing petroleum production, including liquefied natural gas and exports from North America, Qatar, East Africa, Papua New Guinea, and the Eastern Mediterranean. And the third is pressuring Saudi Arabia to raise output of petroleum products, which has not really worked in the past, so it's probably not a real option. But it's actually a lot more complex than even just considering how potential gaps in energy supply could be filled in the short run. Russia's moves have sent energy prices through the roof which encourages more fossil fuel production overall. High prices also upset consumers, which is bad news for politicians across the globe. In addition, Putin needs the revenues from fossil fuel exports to continue funding this war, and it's not looking good for him. International energy firms are considering leaving Russia, and while sanctions have not yet targeted the energy sector, there is potential Europe could consider this if the situation escalates further. All this to say these extremely complex conditions have put the issue of energy independence front and center right now. Now let's turn a little bit and look at this against the backdrop of this new IPCC report that came out this week. The report states that things are actually worse than we thought. We have reached 1.1 degrees of warming, which is causing wide ranging effects from melting ice sheets to destruction of coral reefs. Worse yet, these climate related impacts are hitting the world at the high end of what modelers originally expected and much more quickly than previously assessed. Many of these impacts of global warming are irreversible and 40% of the world's population is considered highly vulnerable, with many people and animals already dying from extreme weather events. The report implores us to act now because there is still a brief window of time available to avoid the very worst consequences. But most importantly for what we're discussing in this video is that the report clearly states that fossil fuels are choking humanity. I think the situation with Russia has created a clear impetus for all countries and particularly those in Europe to speed up the transition to clean, diversified, and where possible independent sources of energy. However, the bad news is the short term picture. As I mentioned, transforming energy infrastructure takes time and short term spikes in energy prices and additional production needed to fill gaps will lead to increased fossil fuel production overall and emissions growth. In a worst case scenario, these reactions could set back decades of progress in eliminating coal and lessening dependence on fossil fuels if we don't handle the situation delicately. In addition, war itself is a major emitter and countries may feel the need to invest more heavily in their militaries with the looming threat of war. This would pull away funding from things that we actually need and the solutions that are necessary to create a brighter future. We have to be extremely careful of the short term steps we take, no matter what the long term goal. The IPCC report has made it very clear that our window of opportunity is closing quickly time is of the essence. In all this darkness, I do think there are tiny glimmers of hope, at least for the energy dimension of the conflict. The speed and unity in which countries have acted against Russia in the face of this war does provide a model and hope that they can do the same for the transition of our energy systems from dirty and unstable to clean and secure. Thank you so much for watching. As always, I do provide a blog post that summarizes this video in writing and has links to my research and resources where you can learn more. If you learned something in this video, give it a like and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, keep fighting the good fight. Bye.